A very good evening and a warm welcome to another episode of Law and Order. And today, for our program on Law and Order, we are happy to welcome to our studio at Sri Lanka Rupwahini Corporation, Shamali Jayatunga, attorney at law. Thank you, Shahara, for inviting me again. So it's a um, pleasure to have you. And also, um, having a follow-up on our earlier discussion on employment law, today we would like to focus on how employment law practically uh, is implemented in Sri Lanka. So being a practitioner for many years in fields of employment law, what are the main issues in employment which are um, highlighted or brought to court in okay. Sri Lanka? Um, I'd like to focus on certain aspects, not restricted to court, but which also get settled at the Department of Labor. Sri Lanka is very employee friendly. Sometimes even if you have a very good case, the officers, especially at the Labor Department, even at the tribunals, try to be empathetic to their issue, recognizing that there is an uneven bargaining power between an employer and employee, and try to give what is called just and equitable relief. So a lot of employees actually think that when they go to the Labor Department, they need a lawyer. But I would say that because of how employee friendly the Department of Labor is, merely lodging a complaint will give you all the required assistance you need by the Department of Labor. And in fact, it is the employers who more often than not end up requiring legal assistance because they are fighting an uphill battle when they face these offices. Uh, one of the most commonest issues that I say is employers don't pay employees on time. They either delay it by a month, don't pay at all, and employees are helpless because either they have to switch the job or they have to accept this delayed payment because in the interest of you know, having a good relationship with the employer. But that is not the case. Because if an employee is not being paid on time, you don't have to wait till the relationship terminates. If you are brave enough, if you want to take action to vindicate your rights, you just need to write to the Commissioner of Labor, giving details of your company and its address, and they will immediately come and inspect your complaint of either delayed payment and immediately take action. And they they are very prompt in that regard because they are very sensitive to the fact that employees um, require these funds on an urgent basis and they don't really delay too much. The other aspect I see is with regard to these deductions that employers make. Now employers love making deductions. They say, well, you haven't, you have breached this, you have broken that you have not returned this item, so therefore I'm going to deduct it against your salary. But are you entitled to deduct or make, uh, like, for example, um, deduct payments which the employee has not consented to? I would argue no, because first of all, the Shop and Office Act, one of the legislation, is very specific about what kind of deductions you can make. And even when you make deductions, you can't exceed a certain threshold. What the employees simply do is, if the employee has a 100,000 rupee salary, you deduct 90,000 out of it and give him, say, a balance of 10,000, which is not permitted by law. You cannot do deductions like that. And this often happens where the employee doesn't know their rights. So they feel guilty, they're scared, they're worried that this amount will be deducted, and they just bear it. But again, if you make the complaint to the Department of Labor, you don't have to go into litigation, a protracted litigation. Um, the Department of Labor will enforce um, the obligations under the Shop and Office Act. Another aspect I said would say is where people terminate because you're inefficient or they think you're incompetent. Say, for example, they hire an accountant who says, well, I know all the law. Um, I know my accountancy qualifications. I'm well qualified. But then they later on, when they get the employee to work, realize, well, this person isn't particularly good at their work. 
Now, how do you solve problems like that in the perspective from a perspective of an employer? Because Sri Lanka is very strict with regard to termination, and incompetency and inefficiency is not a ground of misconduct. And unfortunately, you are stuck with that employer. So, how does an employer balance this issue? How does he ensure that his interests are protected? One way is to use a probationary period. A probationary period on an ordinary scale can be six months, extended maximum for a further period of six months. You can't unreasonably keep extending the employees, hoping one day you will find a problem with the employee. And use that period of six months to evaluate whether this particular employee should be terminated or not. Because during the probation period, the employer doesn't have to give reasons as long as he can establish that I terminated you in good faith because you didn't fit my organization. What often happens is the employees rush to give letters of uh, making the employees permanent. Once they make them permanent, what happens is uh, you find it is very difficult to terminate the employee. So an, uh, a good employer should actually make use of that opportunity given by the law to test whether a particular employee is suitable to your organization without unnecessary issues coming. The other issue that I see very regular, EPF, ETF payments. Um, and uh, if I'm correct, most organizations do not pay EPF, ETF. Well, the informal organizations. Yes, informal organizations, they don't. So there are two mistakes the informal organizations do. They think, well, I don't have enough of employees because I'm hiring only one or two people. Therefore, I don't have an obligation to play EPF, ETF, which is incorrect. EPF, ETF applies irrespective of the number of employees that you have, unless you're a close-knit family organization you have an obligation to play what is called a contribution to an employer's provident fund, where you deduct 8% from the salary of the employee, and you contribute 12% equivalent to the same basis that you use for the 8% uh, deduction. And ETF is a uh, contribution to the employee's uh, trust fund, is where you contribute 3% based on a certain remuneration computation to the fund. Now what happens is that employees, employers, they don't pay because they see this as an additional expense. They see it as an extension of income tax. So what they do is they save money by neither some deduct from the employees and don't pay, some don't deduct at all and they don't pay. Now what happens here is sometimes even the employees don't know. They don't know that it's not deducted or they're not paying attention. They don't know that they have these rights. And later on, years pass. Then somebody informs the employee, well, you are entitled to EPF and ETF. And if they lodge a complaint at the Department of Labor again, you will be liable to pay EPF, ETF. They will file action against you for non-payment of EPF, ETF. You'll be liable to pay a surcharge on that EPF, ETF. So then what happens is the employer who was trying to save money by not making payment ends up going to court, paying for lawyers, paying surcharges, and generally not uh, being f found liable even personally because the first thing they do in court practice, and this is not the correct way in my view, they summon the director or the chairman to courts. So you have to waste time in courts, defending yourself and if you're a repeat offender, you're looked at very harshly uh, by certain judges. So, so this is a very common problem. Another issue is some people pay EPF ETF, but they deduct the entire 20% from the employee's salary. So if you get 100,000, they have deducted 20,000 from the employee's salary and have nicely repatriated to the employers uh, as, as as even including the employer's contribution. So these are all statutory offenses. Um, another aspect is where employer and the employee comes to an agreement that no EPF, ETF will be paid for. And it's there even in the contract of employment. Are these valid? I would say no. What happens is a smart employee, they get all the money into their hands. 
And then what they do is they make a complaint to the Department of Labor at the end of the employment. Then what happens is the employer who all this time had no liability suddenly have to make provision and find the funds to pay EPF and ETF for the entire duration of an employee's uh, employment, which is a huge sum of money. Along with the surcharge. Yes, there is always a surcharge. Another common issue is non-payment of gratuity. So private sectors, because you don't have an equivalent to a pension, mm -hmm. you have a concept where if you work for more than five years in an establishment with more than, on average, in the last six months, 15 employees, you can get a payment based on the number of years of employment as gratuity, which is a lump sum payment, which is very useful to a lot of employees. A lot of employers ignore this obligation. They don't make provision in their accounts. So the employee has worked for 20 years, no provision, no expectation of making payment. And then again, same issue. They go and make a complaint because they are also looking forward to this because it's going to be a considerable sum. And they go and make a complaint to the Labor Department. And then more often than not, you end up in a situation where you are again required to pay gratuity plus surcharge, plus appear before court proceedings, all of that. Another aspect that I have come across is how people love suspending employees without pay. Because obviously when an employee does something wrong, the employer is naturally very, shall we say, angry. So then what they do is they say, OK, I'm going to investigate what you do. And I'm going to suspend you from service until I finish my investigation. And then sends a letter saying, I'm suspending you without pay, not with pay. But technically, it is an established principle under law that you can only suspend an employee without pay if the employee, by a contract of employment, has agreed to be uh, suspended without pay. If your contract doesn't have a provision for suspension without pay, you can't suspend an employee without pay. And then what happens is you suspend them, they go to the labor department or to courts, and then you end up paying the all the back wages that was due from the period of suspension to termination, and then if termination is also not justified, and thereafter, henceforward. The, the reality is that employment is very much protected in Sri Lankan law. So if you, an employee wins a case in the labor tribunal, it can be a significant amount of compensation. And this compensation, you can't even go up in appeal if you don't deposit that amount that has been awarded as a security. You're not even allowed to go up in appeal. So a lot of employers, they are shocked at the outcome. So my advice to the employers out there is to really consider when you're terminating employees, creating grounds where the employee is forced to resign, whether you should actually be terminating this employee because you end up having a bigger liability than had the employee actually served in your organization. But there will be good grounds for you to terminate. They will be engaging fraud, misconduct, loss of confidence. I'm not saying don't ever terminate the employees, but a lot of emplo employers, they terminate for political reasons, personal agendas, just because they don't like the employee. But then they realize the cost is very, very high of doing so, because sometimes they are reinstated back in the business, they are given a lot of back wages, damages. So a lot of people don't really think about this when they are terminated. So um, that also brings me to the next question. You, you said that terminating a person is um, very difficult in Sri Lanka. Yes. So there is a specific act which deals with termination, termination of uh, Employees and Workmen's Act. Yeah. So there is an act yeah. called Termination of Employment um, of Workmen's, of Workmen's Act. Act. It's a special provisions yeah. act. And that particular act is unique in so much as it covers only non-disciplinary termination. If you terminate an employee for any reason, be it because you want to close your business, because you want to, um, 
to get rid of the position in which the employee is, or you just, just don't like the employee anymore. So you come strictly under that particular act, which is what we informally call the TEVA. Now, this particular act is unique in the sense that it says, in order to terminate an employee on non-disciplinary grounds, that means not for grounds other than misconduct, that means inefficiency, even incompetency, as I told you before, is not misconduct. So it will all fall under this. You have to get either the employee's permission or you have to get the commissioner of labor's permission. Now, it seems quite straightforward, right? You go to the commissioner of labor, you make the application. Then, subject to conditions, the commissioner of labor should allow you to terminate, right? That doesn't really happen quite as well as you envisage because if the employee says, okay, I'm willing to go, then the inquiring officer will, they have a formula where there is a maximum cap of 1.25 mil, uh, 1 million 250,000 uh, payment for a particular employee under the act. You pay that subject to that cap and you walk away. But I have come under situations where you have had employees who don't like the organization doesn't want to work but on principle is fighting the termination. They know that if a decision is given in their favor they will have to go back to the organization which is trying so hard to terminate them but they would prefer that as an alternative of getting compensation. So sometimes these hearings can go for months and months. There was a particular hearing I did, I did it close to like by the time the entire proceedings were over, it was more than six months. So for six months, you're paying the salary of this employee and fighting to terminate that particular employee because you can't stop the salary because you have made an application, because you have still not got the permission. And the cost of fighting, and then another two, three months decision time takes for the order to come, whether you are allowed to terminate, and close to a year has passed. So the practicality of us trying to terminate an employee is very tough because there is the inquiry, cross-examination, then you have <coughs> submissions, then you have objections. There is a series of procedure of natural uh, justice principles to be followed to terminate. So you can see why an employee employer easily gives up because it's really not worth the time and effort. Now what happens sometimes is because it's so hard, employers just close down the business and go. Like that, that's something that happens practically. What they do is they just go missing. After a particular day, there is this mysterious notice on the workman's factory uh, premises saying, well, we've closed business, so please don't report to work henceforward. So then the only remedy that the uh, commissioner uh, of labor can do is actually to give compensation because the whole point of having an inquiry is uh, of no point because the company doesn't function anymore. So then what happens is sometimes the hand is forced and that I don't approve of how it's done, but I have seen that practically happen where the commissioner then focuses their attention against the directors to recover the amounts due under the compensation formula. So that's something. But something we need to consider is employment security is also very good. But if you can't give provision to clauses which says employer is entitled to terminate an employee with three months notice, which is there in the contract of employment, we become very unattractive as an investment destination because all these foreign country uh, companies which come to Sri Lanka, their experience is that when you have a contractual provision, unless it's very unfair and unethical, and I don't think a three-month contractual provision is, they're used to being able to enforce, but they're told, well, you can insert it. It's valid when it comes to the employee, because the employee must give the employer the notice, but the employer can't just terminate a permanent contract of employment like that. So what happens in practice is a lot of employers start using various techniques one of the most common techniques is this so-called fixed term contract of employment. Now, fixed term contract of employment, it says, well, you're employed for a period of two years. 
But then miraculously at the end of the second year, there's another fixed term contract of employment, which the employees force because for continuity of service, um, is entering into a further two years. And then without you realizing it, you realize that this employer has been employing somebody for 10 years using two years or one year fixed term contracts of employment. Because the difference is the law is of the position that when it comes to fixed term contracts of employment, is it has a duration. And there is no termination at the end of the period. What often happens is that it's called a lapse of contract. So it is not strictly a termination in terms of TEVA or any other law. But there is case law which in Sri Lanka, because we are employee protective, which says that, look, if you keep extending the contract of employment almost as if automatically, without further evaluation of the terms of contracts of employment, whether he's required, and it's, it, it's a farce, basically. Uh, Labor Department and even the courts can hold, no, this is a fixed term contract of, em uh, this, this is a permanent contract of employment, which you are using this technique. And a lot of employers, they only face it at the end. When it's terminated and the employee is unhappy, then the employee goes and makes a complaint. And when you make this complaint, they immediately investigate into it. And if it's automatic renewal, well, the employer is going to be in a bit of a shock. So along with uh, termination, <coughs> Sri Lanka has a very elaborate Industrial Disputes Act. And uh, it gives many, many, like a wide, um, spectrum of uh, remedies for a person who is aggrieved by his employment contract or who is aggrieved by a decision of the employer or the employee, would you be able to elaborate on uh, the Industrial Disputes Act? And we have only uh, about two or three minutes left of our program as well. Okay. So in terms of remedies that is available under the Industrial Disputes Act, we have conciliation, we have arbitration, and we have access primarily to the labor department, uh, labor tribunals. And out of this, I would say the most, all three are, pretty, are used a lot. In addition to that, employees are permitted to make complaints to the Depart Commissioner of Labor with regard to the various grievances or breach of terms of employment or anything related to do with employment which is statutorily protected. And what happens is immediately a hearing is given before a labor officer. And then, on, with the labor officer, if there is a settlement that is entered into, you enter into what is called a binding section 12.1 settlement most of the time, which means that it's a full and final settlement. But sometimes what happens is there are certain matters which the labor department feels they cannot, it's not within their mandate. So a, a common thing that a labor department uh, sends for arbitration is when you have uh, allowances, contractual allowances under a contract, a common thing for a labor department to go is an employee complains that I have not been paid my allowances. They take the salaries handled by the Department of Labor, they go to prosecute you for that. With respect to the allowances, if there is a dispute as to why the allowance is not being paid, what happens is they send it immediately to um, arbitration. And then there is a reference by the minister, there it's published, and then subsequently it's a big procedure. It's a very good procedure because again you have arbitral award which can have um, legal effect. The third aspect is the labor tribunals. Now what is interesting to note is that the labor tribunal application must be made within six months of, uh, especially with regard to termination, um, you need to make that application within six months. If you, if there is a time lapse, there is a high possibility that your application will get rejected unless you saw some exceptional grounds. The other important thing you need to know is if you are alleging to go to the labor tribunal, you must not first go to any other uh, dispute um, uh, resolution mechanisms in the uh, set out in the Industrial Disputes Act because if you do so, there is a provision uh, in, the, um, in the Industrial Disputes Act where the Labor Tribunal President can't entertain your application if you have already invoked another provision prior. 
So something that you have to always keep in mind is before you go to Teva, before you go to the Labor Department and invoke other procedure, file a Labor Tribunal application first because that gives you an option to decide which is the more favorable procedure to follow at a later stage. All right. So uh, with that, we uh, conclude once again another successful episode of Law and Order. And on behalf of Sri Lanka Rupa and Corporation, we are thankful to Shimali Jayatunga, attorney Thank at you. law, for being here and uh, for sharing um, her wealth of knowledge on the sphere of employment law. And once again, we'll meet next week on Law and Order.